Welcome back to the BDGE Fantasy Football Channel. This is a little bit uh, of a different setup, and y'all need to get used to it. If you've been uh, following right. the Dynasty channel, which has skyrocketed this offseason, we just launched it, but it's doing really well over there. If you play Dynasty, make sure you subscribe. This is Adam. This is Andrew. Uh, I'm sure you are familiar with them if you watch any of those videos. But if you're just tapping back into the Redraft channel, we will be doing these group podcasts at least twice a week, and don't worry, you'll still get plenty of Nick face-to-face time. Those videos will still be churning out, but we want to make sure that we are up in the volume. So starting literally right now, you'll be getting minimum five videos a week. It is that time of the summer. Uh, And make sure you're subscribed to both of their channels as well if you need extra fantasy football content on the way. Today's video, we are going to be playing a little buy, sell, hold. Now, we do this on the Dynasty channel, and it's a little bit easier because there's always trades going on in Dynasty. For redraft, what we're going to be doing is looking at the ADPs of these players on underdog. If you're not on underdog or familiar with it, they're best ball drafts. So a lot of people are drafting right now. They are money league, so all the ADP is very concise and very serious based on real news and stuff that's happening right now. So we're each going to be nominating players based on their current ADP and then choosing whether we want to buy, sell, hold them basically from a drafting perspective. Do we like them at their price? Do we hate them at their price? Are we cool with that price? Like, you know, if they fall to us there, I'm going to draft them, all right? So we will be nominating. We'll put it on the whiteboard, and we will continue to churn these videos out for y'all. I'm going to rip off the first one. Do it. You guys ready? Being ready. ready. My first player is Cooper Cup, Los mm-hmm. Angeles Rams wide receiver. Currently the wide receiver 23 on underdog drafts, all the way up at 31.3. Now, underdog obviously skews very heavily towards wide receivers, uh, so you start more in that league setting. I don't know necessarily that we need to dive too much into like that aspect of it and and more just like player talk in general what we expect for the upcoming season for this guy yeah but 31.3 that's kind of like back end ish of the third round wide receiver 23 back end wide receiver two how are we feeling about mr mr coop i'm gonna buy interesting uh i i just i just went over my rankings again and i must put hold because i i have him as wide receiver 24 so it's like okay that's about spot on to where i have him at so i say hold just because you know I, i feel confident drafting him at that spot uh, I don't want to draft him much ahead of that just because there's guys that I really believe in this year. But if it was going much past that, I would definitely be in. Where are you at, Andrew? Talk to me about the buy. Yeah, uh, I just think he's a little bit undervalued right now. I have him a little bit higher than you do in my rankings. I think I'm 22, 21 range, somewhere like that. Um, yeah. But I just think he's a little bit undervalued probably because last year, you know, memory of what Cooper Cup did was he's hurt a lot of the year. And Puka Nakua also emerges. And because of that, I think when... We have an exciting young player, especially in fantasy football, that emerges. You kind of fade the other people kind of around them, especially when the other guy's older and is dealing with injuries. So I think it's kind of been out of sight, out of mind for Cooper Cup. But when he was on the field, especially in the back half of the year, you look like weeks 11 through 17 um, when we were playing all the way through our fantasy football playoffs. The target volume was almost a 50-50 split. It was like 49 targets for Cooper Cup, 50 for Puka Nakua. So when they were both on the field, when they both were healthy, uh, it seems like they are still going to get Cooper Cup the ball. And so I think he still has some, I mean, right now where you're drafting him as a wide receiver two, a low end wide receiver two, I think he has a little bit more upside than that in your lineup. Yeah, the more the more I've been kind of like diving into the situation, I think I like Cup more and more as the offseason is progressing. Like he's an easy buy for me at that price, I think. And we're going to be doing like a wide receiver debate video for our redraft rankings. And I think I might be the highest on Cup. I think I swapped him like two nights ago or last night up to like maybe 19 ish in that okay. range. I agree with you. Like last year for me, he was one of the easiest fades coming into the year because he fucked up his hamstring like multiple times. Then again, right before the season started missed, you know, a bunch of time in the beginning yeah. took a while for him to get back up to speed. You Soft merge. tissue, older guy early on. Is yeah. Just a whole great. lot of red flags and problems. Uh, but again, back half of the year, what I think happened is like Puka kind of wiped out his floor. So we were always used to cup having like, at worst, a 7 for 75 game kind of thing. That really, like, bottomed out because when 140 passing yards go elsewhere, it's like, okay, you don't really have enough to eat everywhere. I do think it's kind of a situation, though, similar to uh, we talk about, like, Miami, where it's going to be a relatively condensed target tree, right? Like, it's going to be Cup, and it's going to be Puka Nakua kind of over and over and over again. And Mm -hmm. Stafford last year played 15, but his 17-game pace would have put him, like, five yards behind the league leader of Tua there. Touchdown numbers were there. Uh, Kyron took a fuckload of goal line touches, obviously. If that skews a little bit more towards uh, the receivers or, or Stafford just passing it down on the goal line, I think the yep. touchdown upside is there. I don't know that I'm, like, expecting Cup to surpass 13, 1,400 yards, but I feel good enough that, like, the injuries led him a little bit astray last year. 
I, f- I feel confident projecting this offense to sustain them at like 1,100 yards minimum-ish, and that's a great return. And for it's not round. a huge thing either um, because he's not like a huge part of their offense, but he's still a starting player in that offense. But Tyler Higby most likely will not play the first half of this right, year. Right, ACL. So he's probably not going to be getting any receiving targets. I mean, he won't be. Yeah, and that's a red zone there's really not too, a lot yeah. of guys Hello, Colby behind Parkinson. him. Hello, Colby Parkinson. Colby Parkinson, Davis Allen. Like, those are the guys kind of behind them. And uh, one other thing that I wanted to bring up, which I thought was interesting, I was I was listening to a podcast recently where Puknaku was on it, and he was talking about last year and his rookie season. Actually, he said that he had to gain weight and play at a heavier weight last year because they knew that Cooper Cup was banged up, and he had to stay healthier, so he gained weight to kind of make sure that he would be, be able fine. to carry the load. And so this year, he said, now that Cup's healthy, they've been working out all offseason, he said he's going to he's cutting weight, he's going to play at a lighter weight this year because they're expecting a fully healthy cup, and uh, and that's going to kind of change the dynamic of how that wide receiver room yeah, works. Yeah, those guys, just their weekly ceiling. Like, if I told you, all right, next year, Rams receivers are going to combine for, there's going to be seven, I would say six instances where one of the wide receivers is going to go over 150 receiving yards in a game. How are you going to split that up between the two of them? Over the course of the season? Yeah. Four next two. year, there's six instances. 4-2. Four 4-2, two. Four two, Puka, two for cup. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like that's probably right. Like the fact yeah. that like, I, I still think like Cup has those like hundred and seventy yard games in his bag. Again, the floor is probably a little bit lower, but like I, I still think in that offense and here's the thing with Cup too. It's it's not like listen, he's a great receiver and has definitely progressed as like a route runner, but he was never a dude who needed to be Tyree Kill or needed to be Julio Jones. Right. He was schemed into just like fucking amazing target availability there. So even if he's lost a little bit of his step in terms of, you know, breakaway ability or whatever the case may be, like McVeigh puts him in spots where there's not defenders within seven yards. And now you add a real, another guy like Puka who demands a ton of attention. Like Cup feels a, like a really good third round pick. Well, I mean, for sure. You, you, if you ever listen to Cooper Cup after a game or on any talking like on a podcast, something like that. The guy's IQ is outrageous. Mm-hmm. He's never been a guy that wins off athleticism. He he knows where to be. And Matthew Stafford and the rapport they have is ridiculous. So, like, for me, the reason I have him as a hold or in this range, if he's fully healthy and playing, I don't think there's any talent issue. or he's. I don't see a problem with, like, Cooper Cup you, performing. But you don't see that? I think maybe that's what some of the market is kind of, like, baking into it. The fact that, like, did Cooper Cup lose his step? Now, getting older, you know, it's always a question. Yeah. And, I mean, there was, uh, there was reasons to see it in the middle part of the season. There was, like, I think three games where he played the whole time and didn't do anything. Yeah. Now, part of that was actually, I think Matthew Stafford missed some time at that point, too. Yeah. Remember then Cooper Cup also, right after the bye, I don't know if you guys remember this, Cooper Cup right after the bye, he played like, I don't know, a handful of snaps and then like tweaked something, missed the rest of the game. Yeah. This is a thing for me where I bake this in, actually, right or wrong. This is the way I, I process it. This guy's over the age of 31. Like, Sometimes your body just gives out on you. Yeah. Yeah. And you look at, like, Julio Jones. Like, I actually don't think anything really became a problem for Julio Jones other than he just he used to play through all of those nagging injuries. Now he couldn't. And yeah. a soft tissue over and over for me, I bake that into the floor. And I just see it as, has he lost a step? Probably a little bit. But does he still have a high, high end range of outcomes? Yeah. But is he going to be healthy the whole season? And is it going to be a frustrating situation with him? I think so. I, I think what will end up happening is I think uh, – I think he'll end up being a back back of the second round pick. I think he'll end up in like the two twelve to eleven range by the time redraft picks. Which would, be, yeah. which would be like wide receiver twenty type thing, or wide receiver eighteen. Where, like, I would, where? I would, yeah, like seventeen to twenty range. Okay. Uh, yeah. I would assume. I would say at that point too, maybe uh, higher. It would definitely change the buy uh, that I feel. Today. I would get a little bit more hesitant on yeah. it. Yeah. I, I think uh, I think it'll be a good. This will be a good little leeway into the other video where we do the wide receiver rankings too. Yeah, for the sure. debates for, for sure. sure. All right, y'all got. Funny you brought up a Los Angeles Ram because I want to keep talking about this team. Uh, the guy that I want to nominate is Kyron Williams. <sighs> That's one of mine. And Kyron Williams last year broke out dominant player, 21.3 fantasy points per game, which was the second overall running back from a points per game standpoint. Currently right now on underdog, being drafted with an ADP of 30. That makes him a third round pick, and that makes him the running back eight overall. So he is kind of sandwiched right now between guys like Devon A. Chan above him, Saquon Barkley above him, and then below him, Derrick Henry, Travis Etienne. Um, there's a decent gap between Etienne and, and Henry and Kyron, but um, also puts him in a range where cross-positionally you're having guys like DJ Moore, Stephon Diggs, Cooper Cup, Michael Pittman. They're all mm-hmm. kind of in the same range. So uh, how do we feel about Kyron Williams right now as the running back eight? Sell with shades of hold. Buy with shades of buy. Wow. <laughs> nice. All right, tell me why. We have very opposite uh, ends of the spectrum here. 
I mean, third round Kyron feels like he has legit league winning upside, I think. You want to talk about like running backs that win your leagues or guys who average over 20 points per game. He could be a dude who scores like that vintage Todd Gurley type of touchdown upside. We're like Gurley, obviously a much more explosive player, but the years when he was scoring 16, 18, 20 touchdowns, like the majority of those were just on the goal line. You know, so like Kyron scored a ton of fucking touchdowns on the goal line. We just talked about Cooper Cup. Like maybe that leans the other way. I don't know. They 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 seemed like they wanted to run the ball when they got down there, and Kyron was such a a force down there. He was so it was like Aaron, like maybe undersized, but the way that Aaron Jones was good on the goal line, those types of guys. So yeah, yeah uh, Blake Corum is there and will take some touches for sure, but I don't think that's going to bring Kyron down to the point where it's enough to get him into the third round for me. Are you worried at all about the fact that Kyron Williams is missing time uh, early on this offseason already with, like, foot and ankle injuries? And meanwhile, Sean McVay's talking a whole lot of good about how Blake Corum has been performing. Does that worry you at all? Uh, No, because uh, I'm not surprised Blake Corum is performing well. I think he's a good running back. Like, that's no, yeah. that's no surprise to me. I think he's the perfect guy for a Sean McVay offense. He's not going to fuck anything up. When McVay, you look at historically, it's like a bunch of dudes that McVay just gets pissed at over and over again where Akers can't read a fucking hole for his Darryl life. Anderson. Like. Yeah, like all these guys keep doing that, and he's like, all right, let's get some stability back here for if Kyron gets hurt. Um, so it's easy, I think, to to shift your dynasty mindset into redraft, but like Kyron, I don't want to buy in dynasty whatsoever because I think it's going to be one more really good year, and then the questions start to really emerge. For redraft, I think him dropping down this far for someone that could be the the difference in you winning a league is is – what I'm trying to invest in here. I believe in the offense. I believe in the coaching scheme. And Kyron just showed us like there, there's no reason not to believe in him. Okay. Uh, the foot injury, I'm not really – it was super minor. It was a couple of weeks ago, a month ago, and they said he'd be perfectly ready. Fair enough. I'm not too worried. Yeah, I mean, he's at running back eight, though. Like, I, I, I definitely believe there's other running backs that offer me league-winning upside this season that aren't Kyron Williams. And Kyron Williams, like, last year, hell yeah, he offered you league-winning upside. He's playing 90 fucking percent of the snaps. Like, that – I don't think that's continuing to happen. Now, to your point, like, I think he's still going to be very efficient around the goal line. I think he'll still be a good running back. I just believe that the ceiling is capped from what we saw last year. I don't think he's going to be a bad running back. I think, like, if you told me it was running back 10 to 12, I'm probably more comfortable there. That's where I say so. Like, to me, there's just Derrick Henry, I think, this year in, uh, in Baltimore, Devon A-Chain. Uh, like, I really think Isaiah Pacheco has a chance to take off for KC. There's other names that I just prefer to Kyron here where, like, I think that they have – just as much upside, but also probably a little better floor as well. I think that Blake Corum could come in and actually command, let's even say it's conservative. Like, let's say the splits are like 65% to Kyron. You think that's conservative? You think Blake Corum is more likely to go above that to like 40, 45? I think that's crazy. No, I think I think conservative would say that, like, you think Kyron's going to play more than 65% locked in? I would say for sure that's his floor right now, yeah. Quorum just, after what Kyron did last year, Quorum just coming in and commanding 40 to 45% of no, I'm saying, No, I'm saying conservative, like 30 to 35% right there. That's right, but you said conservative 35. So if that if you're being conservative, you're saying like I think the co- average or realistic would be like No, I'm 40. saying conservatively, like if Kyron, I, you think that it's conservative to say Blake Quorum's only getting 35% snaps? I think that's pretty conservative, no? It's a pretty, for a third round pick, that's, oh, I'm saying they, Blake Quorum gets 35% of snaps. Kyron Williams gets 65% of snaps. I think that's conservative to cap Kyron there. I'm, I think I think I'm are we sure. saying the same thing or are I'm we not, saying I'm opposite? Like things? I, I don't think you're saying the same thing. I, I, if I'm yeah, understanding you, you're saying that it's more likely we have, a, we, have, we have a mediator. No, no, okay, yeah, I, I'm the mediator here. Uh, it's more likely you're saying it's more likely that Blake Corum gets touches than he doesn't, and you're saying it's more likely that Kyron Williams sees the majority of the touches than he doesn't. Yeah, and so I think you guys are both I think we're saying on the same opposite thing, though. sides. Okay, maybe we're not. He's definitely on the side where he's saying that Kyron Williams is going to get a it sounds like you're saying, load of touches. It sounds like you're, you're saying, saying Blake Corum Corum's 35 percent is conservative, and I'm saying Kyron Williams 65 percent is conservative. Okay. Correct. Correct. So it feels like the energy we're saying is like you think it's more likely that Corum's numbers go up, and I'm more likely that that, Kyron's, his, go that up. Kyron's go up from 65. Yeah. So let me just instead of trying to figure out what you're saying, let me tell you what I'm. <laughs> saying. Let, me, let me tell you what I'm. It's my work. Yeah. 65 percent snap share is still really high for running backs. In this day and age, it's actually really, really high. 35% snap share for a third round running back would be kind of a waste on that pick. I mean, it's year one. It's Kyron who just performed really well with 90%. McVeigh, when he has a workhorse, is. But like, what was the problem with 90%? He got hurt. Like they, they obviously use, they invest day two draft capital to try to lessen the workload. I think that's why I'm saying conservatively. I don't. That's why, like, I don't think conservative would be dropping it down to 65%. I think he'll start off at 75%, something like that. Like, I think Quorum will work in 
maybe grab a drive here or there, which, you know, could be the difference in going from 22 points per game to like 18, but I'm still happy with that. And I just think historically, like when McVay has a dude that he really likes and trusts, he's, he's riding that guy until he doesn't need to. So, so let me ask this question because I want to put an actual physical representation for us out there. Do you think this split is going to be closer to what we're seeing with Kenneth Walker and Zach Charbonnet? Is it going to be more or less than that? That's basically what I want to say. That's yeah. kind of tough. I mean, Charbonnet got very little run when Walker was out there. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. And that, what was that about? Thirty percent snaps? Mm, I don't know off the top of my head. I couldn't. I'll tell pull you. it up because I, like, I bet if it, I bet if you really narrowed it down to just when those two were healthy and on the like mm-hmm. playing together, it would be like lower than that. If that, I was well, I, I'm going to pull it up because because and the reason why I bring that right. up is because when we looked last year, when Kenneth Walker was on the field, you didn't want to play Zach Charbonnet. You didn't want to roster, really, Zach Charbonnet, other than he's yeah. just a handcuff for Kenneth Walker. Yeah, he was a dud, a complete yeah. dud. So this is, see, this is where it's really interesting. I'm glad you brought this up for context. Zach Charbonnet, in the first four weeks before the bye, 25, 26, 43%, and 25% snaps early on, right? Then after that, weeks 8, 9, 10, when Kenneth Walker's body started to break down a little bit, 59, 55, 52. Then he actually got hurt, and he played like 85% of snaps. But the second half of the year... He was playing anywhere from 45 to 60% of snaps when he was on the field with Kenneth Walker. And we kind of think, like, he didn't play very much. Uh, Yeah, I mean, like, that to me is not really an indication of the play to get. That That to me was more like a Kenneth Walker health thing. But isn't that what isn't that kind of like the, the thing with Kyron? Like, not that he isn't great, but you want to kind of lessen his workload so that he doesn't get hurt? Well, they've, they have said that the reason why they brought Quorum in was to kind of yeah, just spell, lighten just, the load. Just lighten, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, I, I have no doubt that's going to happen. Like, I'm not sitting here being like it's going to be a 90-10 split, but I just think, like, Kyron's going to play 70-75%. I don't see a reason why he wouldn't. McVay trusts the shit out of him. And where do, like, the valuable touches go? And I think those are on the goal line. Like, Kyron can see 70% of the touches or 70% of the snaps and score 13 rushing touchdowns this year kind of thing. I get what you're saying. Like, the, there are running backs behind him that I also fucking really like, and maybe it's just speaking more to the fact of, like, the running backs going this late or a nice, like, pendulum swing that we could really like hit value in that third fourth round with those guys but yeah I, I just I think I think this is like appropriately priced for Kyron and I'd be happy taking him in the yeah. third round if he drops there for what it's worth as the mediator of this discussion boom I have him as my running back eight in my rankings and he's okay. being drafted as running back eight so I am right here where Bang. everybody else is I, I actually it's kind of I feel like I gotta at least put this out there just for snap share percentages last year Kyron actually in the full season now I don't know if he left early his full season snap share was 75% last season. Okay. I mean, he missed time. No, nope. uh, sure. Missed time, left games I'm just, earlier. I'm just, like, Christian McCaffrey's workload, 75%, uh, 76. Rashad White was high at 78. Tony Pollard, 70%. I feel like it's it, – it, that was – I'm actually trying to be conservative. I feel like you did, you have a day two pick. 35% is actually pretty low for that. And I just feel like if you just think about it contextually on he needs to get at 75% snap share or 70 even, that's still really, really high and basically – Blake Corm's kind of rendered useless there. I think if that happens, to your point, if he ends up being like uh, utilized that heavily, I think Kyron Williams. I'll be wrong about what Kyron Williams' upside can be. Yeah. I just, I just personally don't think there's any way you use that type of draft capital for a running back that's very similar for him not to at least get more into the snap share of Kyron Williams. Yeah, I mean, I'll, on paper that makes sense. Like day two pick, like he should get a decent amount of work. And I, I guess one of my other things too, you mentioned he has to get that to hit his upside. I also like don't think that's the case. Again, like I think Kyron can register sixty five to seventy percent of the snaps and I would I would say that he'll go above sixty five. But if he is at like sixty eight, I still think he could score a fuckload of touchdowns still, just based on what he saw last year. Like he, he didn't did need last to, year. Right. He didn't need to play ninety percent in order to score all those touchdowns that he did last year. He had a bunch of games with two, three, four fucking touchdowns where like that was the difference maker to me, where I just don't really see a reason outside of you know, some in between the 20s touches, maybe Corin plays a little bit on in passing situations. But I guess with Kyron and McVay, I just really like that situation. And, and, and just for what it's worth, Kyron Williams last year, we talked about number two in a fantasy points per game standpoint. So, yes, there can be regression for Kyron Williams, and he can still be a top eight, a top seven type running back and still be a guy that can help you win a championship here in 2024. Yeah, that's yeah, that's that's kind of where I'm at, too. I don't know if I'm ex- here. Here's, I guess, where I'll put it. Like, I, I'm not expecting last year's output, but to be honest with you, if he did it again, I don't think I'd be totally shocked. Where I don't think that's the sentiment for most people. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like, do you think last year's performance is in his range of outcomes this year? 
honestly. Uh, if Blake Quorum's healthy the whole time? Yes. Yes, but I think it's going to need a lot of luck. I, the games that he really was killing it, as far as, like, uh, when we talk, like, top five, top ten even, let's call it, which top ten top five are very different. You're talking about 25 carries, 20 carries, 27, 22. Like, the guy literally from week 13 on was a 20-plus carry, not to mention five course, to seven yeah. receptions. Like, I just think that the vol- I ov- think you overall could, like, opportunity is the biggest – um, what lends fantasy upside. And yeah. I think that that cat, if you tell me he's getting 15 touches to 18 touches in a game, could he still be really great? Yeah, absolutely. But I think that's very different than a guy that was getting 30 touches in a lot of these games. No, that's fair. Like the workhorse, workhorse upside, maybe not there. I guess my, my POV was becomes, like, you could skim the fat. And I still think that like 90% of the upside can be in that 18 to 20 touches. Because if, if all things being equal, if, if let's say that that happened where he, his workload does get, cut down some, then it actually becomes he needs to get those touchdowns to have the high-end upside. Sure. But I, I'm, gonna I'm not going to say it can't happen. Because we, we've Small. been 20 minutes on Kyron, it feels like. Well, so we, I, we can keep going. This let's, is a good conversation. Uh, you're selling, you're buying, and I'm going to split the difference here because I told you I have an RB8. He's being drafted RB8. I'm holding, baby. All right, so let us, let us know what y'all are doing I, with I, Kyron actually, this yeah, year, dude. I'm kind of curious to hear what people think about yeah, this. Yeah, I want to know the exposures. That's that's like one of the fun things about underdog fantasy is like you, you join a bunch of drafts that are $3, $5, and they allow you to see the number of times or the percentage of teams that you've drafted a specific player on, right? now um so if you guys have been drafting on underdog i want to know your exposure to to kyron williams where he's going earlier on he was a really early draft pick I can, obviously i can predict people are gonna be big mad at me like just the guy that was that good last year people don't want to hear that he uh, i, do that I well. think redraft is a little bit more like uh people are pretty divisive they're like they either i think you'll have a lot of people on your side i think i'll have a lot a lot of people on my side and it'll kind of for the, the record difference. i have 22 percent exposure to kyron 22 okay 22 percent. that's a buy then because yeah. normal exposure say, is about eight percent like twelve teams, eight percent. That's, that's I, a lot. I have twenty two percent. You love him, but no wonder you put him. No wonder he that, nominated. I will say though, I've been doing a lot of. Uh, I've been trying a lot of like bully running back builds. Okay, and so I've been double tapping mm. the running back early on, like Jonathan Taylor and Kyron Williams, so, or something like so that. So you probably have a few running backs that have that percentage. So I got, got a, it. I, my running back percentages for the elite guys is a little bit higher than it probably will end up by actually like August. But yeah, I've just been experimenting with a new strategy. Don't ask about my Troy Franklin exposure. Shit's like 72%. Let's stay on the running back train, huh? Dope. Let's do it. Joshua Jacobs, new scenery. Damn, he was my second player. I thought about he, him today. You took Kyron. We're, yeah. we're out here sniping buy, so hold candidates. Running back 12. Ahead of him is Pacheco. Behind him, James Cook. Uh, adjacent players at cross positions. Dalton Kincaid, Keenan Allen, Jaden Reed. Hollywood Brown, which is the K- The KC hype on underdog is nothing makes me more sick. I That was – I'm ready to – puke with that one but let's remove the hollywood thing anyway that's uh those are the players going around him what pick is he overall he's overall 51.6 this is adp and you said he's the running back running back 12 running back 12 that's like the 503 i i think can i see my phone so i can check my running back rankings yeah i want to say i'm lower than that yeah i'm for me i brought him up because i'm i'm on the sell train with jacobs i'm kind of off him in a redraft this year uh i think i've made a video yeah definitely might be coming out tomorrow Maybe. I think Jacobs was in it. I just am a little bit weary about the situation in Green Bay. Yeah, selling. Double sell. And I'm not really sure. That's like I would be at, too. For the yeah, record. if we look back on it, would I be surprised if he kind of scored like 8, 10 touchdowns? Not really. He'll probably be the workhorse in a pretty good offense. But he's coming off of like one of his worst years, really inefficient. Marshawn Lloyd, like we want to talk about adding a day two back to the backfield. I like Marshawn. Man, no one, I was no one's, ask, I was, that's what I was going to There's a lot of hype about Blake Corn being a problem to Kyron Williams, a lot of hype about Trey Benson being a problem to James Conner. But like Marshawn Lloyd is really going under the radar here for a guy that compliments Josh Jacobs really, really well. Mm-hmm. And I think in that type of offense, like the floor has come out and he's like, yeah, we want to run a committee here. Like, we don't want to give it to one back. And I think he's proven that literally for the last, like, five years consecutively. Aaron Jones has been the best talent there, but they've always used Dylan. They've always used Jamal Williams. They've always used a secondary back. For sure. Even if you go to his time in Tennessee, like, he was using Deion Lewis with Derrick Henry. Going back in the day, yes, sir. The Lou days were fucking in prime. Hey, D. Lou. D. Lou used to kill it, too. D. Lou was him Always spell somebody. But, yeah, I I had to check my phone because I wanted to make sure that I I had the number correct. But I have Josh Jacobs as running back 15 in my ranking. So, him being drafted at 12, a little bit high for me. It's the other guys around him, too. Like, I just give me James Cook. Just give me all those guys that are going, like, Pacheco easily. Give me... Most of the guys around him positionally that I like a lot more. But you know what? If you told me, Tell me. that Josh Jacobs had 12-plus touchdowns this year, That's what I'm saying. I wouldn't be surprised. That's my only 
that offense has been, especially how Jordan Love looked, I could see this offense being really good. And you just want pieces of the offense, right. period. Yep. He could like rumbles. Like Jacobs, listen, like he had his massive year a couple of years ago. In the years prior to that, he was good, but realistically, like on the ground and just as an efficient back, he was never great, but he always just backed into 10 touchdowns, uh -huh. which always worked really well for fantasy. So I don't want to go too far in the other end of the spectrum and be like, Jacobs is a full fade, but I think there are enough red flags there. For you, me. you know what's interesting, though, about that one is like that that was easily, in my opinion, the most efficient and best that offense had been. Derek Carr was pretty good. And sure. what you saw was that actually Jacobs just got – he had like some crazy long runs. He got in space. He had touchdowns. If the if the offense is really good with Jordan Love, you could see like that rising tide just is for, good for everybody. Hundred percent. But on that same sentiment, I, this guy got a four year deal, forty eight million. Have you ever seen Jacobs? Did his deal was four for forty eight. Yeah. But, okay, but it's a lot. It's of really money. just two years. It's but, funny check, money. but check this out. Yeah. Like it's just so at the running back position, it's so fraudulent everywhere. A four year deal that they can get out of after this season, after this year. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay, and then but put in the context, they can get out of his contract and kind of like on a much lesser scale that is not nearly as important, what do they do? They draft a day two running back. Like I said, if that's not hedging your bet, I don't know what is. They've been trying to add to that backfield, I feel like unsuccessfully every single year. Like they, they draft a running back pretty much every AJ year. AJ Dillon was yeah. a, Not two was of a, them. They were playing around with Emmanuel Wilson last Emmanuel year. Emmanuel Wilson. They've, I can't think of Patrick Taylor. Like I can't think of all the running backs that they AJ have, but they Dillon, always do. Yep, what, what do you guys think? We talked about the floor of like Kyron. It, it's, it's a lot harder to project because we don't know what it actually looks like. And it's a new team for him. But yeah. What like is what do we think Marshawn Lloyd early on is actually going to take away from Jacobs in this offense? That that I think is the question yeah. for me that I'm not sure of, but is where I'm leaning. So I don't know, but if you if you ask the Packers, everything that I've heard coming out of that camp is how good Lloyd looks. Yeah, there's a like, lot of buzz. He's been getting almost as much buzz as Corum has. But so. he but he's like Lloyd is the type of player that would get that because like you have like really high end athletes when you're playing in shorts His and stuff like that. Lloyd's the crazy. guy that would look great. Like being super fucking explosive on yep. the field, and my problem with him, you know, just watching his tape, I, in my opinion, I think he's a little bit like crazy when it comes to reading the holes and stuff like that. Where Jacobs is pretty good at that, so yeah. I think they have a good yin and yang, and I think that's they where do. like you need to be a little bit careful with Jacobs. Is feels like he eats most of the time because he's like the ninety percent snap share guy, like Kyron was, and it's like if that comes down, what is Jacobs really? I I think honestly, Marshawn Lloyd is going to evaporate A.J. Dillon's role. Like, For I think sure. A.J. Dillon think is going we, to be we nothing. Um, I think there's, like, a chance Dillon gets cut. I'm not sure what his contract looks like, but he's a player. It was like a one feels, year, like come back and run it back, maybe. Yeah, but like they could get out of it for pretty sure. Quickly. One thing I think we don't talk about enough, uh, at least I, I I've really started to focus on a lot more for the young guys, and I don't know the answer to this. Maybe you do. What's Marshawn Lloyd as a pass blocker? How is he? Mm. Did you know? Do you know? Remember that at all? No, I don't. I don't remember all. Because of my head. like I feel like one of the things that can get the young running backs in trouble. Is when running. they just let that QB you get look you let Jordan Love get lit up one time and it's like that no that yep. doesn't happen that's and nice. early on I could see if that's a problem for him Josh Jacobs has been a guy that's used to handling that three down workload and for me anyway that's one thing that I'm uh, gonna start looking at when I'm looking at this backfield if it's if I think it's ambiguous or if I think there's a lead start look, looking a little more at the young guys as far I'm, as their I'm, pass pro I pass pro on my phone because I was pulling it up we have like the stat sheet that we did for Dynasty stuff yeah uh, yeah his pass blocking grade. Not great. Cheeks. Not I kind of, I kind of was gonna guess that just based on the fact that he's a athlete, his his vision is kind of sketchy. Like I could just see him not being committed to blocking yet. Yeah, I mean that's why Caleb Williams is probably running for his fucking life. <laughs> he don't got Marshawn and, Lloyd back there blocking for his. So ass. then if you tell me like he's probably not gonna get chops on third downs early, like it, I could. He could be specifically a two and four minute drill back. Correct. You know, he's he could be a guy that eats at that because he is. I mean his broken tackles per attempt. Ratio, 37.1, I think was the highest in the entire class. Like, his elusiveness rating, his breakaway runs, like, his percentage yeah. of runs that went for, like, 15-plus yards. Off the charts. Amongst the highest in the class. So, he's got, yeah. like, all of these raw tools to be a crazy explosive athlete. And maybe that eats away at Jacobs. Yeah, for me, Jacobs is really a stay away just based on the other running backs that I like yeah. more. The, the running backs he's going yeah. in the range of. Like, yeah. to me, Pacheco or Jacobs is at Pacheco and by pretty – I agree. Yeah. I agree. I agree. I did really like Lloyd. Like, when it came down to final dynasty rankings, I had my tier one was Brooks and Benson. My tier two was Quorum and Lloyd. So, I, yeah. I think he's up there. We talked about Quorum. We're talking about Lloyd now. But all of these things considered, his well, price is a tiny bit too high for me. If he falls, you know, two or three spots in ADP, I, I'm, I'm with you. Yeah. Back end five, early six, I feel like is like, okay, for Jacobs. Yeah. But 
And, and I mean running back rankings, not just two to three spots in the ADP. Okay. That's yeah, what yeah. originally what I thought. I was like, that's, that feels No, picky. no, no. That's, <laughs> that's like wild. that. Yeah, no. Yeah. Two, if he goes to like running back 14, 15, gotcha. then I'm, I'm more comfortable. All right. What you got, big boy? T- talk to us. Let's talk. see. My second guy, to break the theme of running backs, because I have another running back on here as well, but let's talk about Deontay Johnson. Okay. Uh, because mm. Deontay Johnson finds himself in a new situation here in Carolina, been traded from the Steelers. Now he's presumably the number one. I think we all assume he's going to be the number one there. I'm so torn right now. What, 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 I need to know his ADP, really. Okay, so his ADP right now is 74.9. He's being drafted in the seventh round. What that looks like as far as a value or value-adjacent players, he is sandwiched between DeAndre Hopkins, Keon Coleman, Brian Thomas, and Alvin Kamara. And then below him is David Montgomery, Rasheed Rice, Christian Watson, JSN. I see, okay, yeah. I think I know where I go because almost all my drafts so far have been underdog drafts. And yep. that pocket of players, to me, There's is... There's a lot of upside. I like running backs there. Okay. M- much more. So Deontay's a sell for me. I'm, I'm also kind of unsure about Deontay's just... I'm, I'm unsure about the situation for Deontay. I know a lot of people really like that move to Carolina like where him. they think he's going to command those hundred and, you know, whatever targets. <sighs> I, I have a sell, too. Um, the only reason I was a little unhes- I was a little hesitant, like... The two rookies you throw in there, I, I'm not that early on. Keon and Brian. Super interested in drafting those rookies in uh, the rookie season hype long. Is insane on underdog. But uh, almost all the other guys you mentioned, <laughs> like we talked about Cooper Cup. New Hopkins, I feel like is disrespect in that range, frankly. Yeah, for a redraft. Like for a one season sprint. Come on, man. I crazy. like I like Nuke. Like gimme Kamara, gimme David Montgomery over Deontay Johnson. Cause mm-hmm. I guess my thing is like, sure, Deontay Johnson's gonna be the one there, but he's also like had 140 targets every, every fucking year and very rarely does he ever hit like an upside like he ends up scoring three four five passing touchdowns and like talk about whatever quarterback you want to in Pittsburgh but it ain't like Bryce is gonna throw for 27 passing touchdowns this year well the year he was wide receiver eight he actually had a shit ton of touchdowns and that was the year that like Big Ben was just early on in the year he was he, he was cooked but early on in the year they were un, they were like undefeated for a while yeah and he was just forcing the ball to him like How many he was t- gonna be I mean AB. you say shit low but like I feel like I feel like he got almost double digit touchdowns I'm, I'm pulling it I feel up like it was like eight so or nine he was, right he yeah was that's the, a lot for him, for him though, though. That's yeah what I'm, exactly yeah, yeah. he guess. was the wide receiver eight from a fantasy points per game perspective in 2021 he had eight touchdowns that year the there year before go. he was the wide receiver 22 in fantasy points per game but he had seven touchdowns okay so but yeah those um, are both, those are like big Ben years though those are both big Ben where he was like 30 do you remember, I don't know if you guys remember this, but they literally, when they traded away Antonio Brown, they traded him away for that pick, and they drafted Deontay Johnson. And if you look like stature, uh, max school, like it's actually eerily similar. They yeah. tried to use him as AB. Yeah. So and it worked for a long time mm-hmm. ish. For two, for those two seasons yeah. with him. For Last sure. year in Pittsburgh was actually his lowest targets, his lowest receptions. And his second lowest receiving yardage of his career. Yeah. So he's coming off of a pretty down a year. Bit, right? yeah, yeah, he missed uh, three games or four is games. Is he the Josh Jacobs of receivers right now? But mm. he, is he the Josh Jacobs of receivers? Now, he's not being drafted like Josh Jacobs. He's nah. being drafted, like, way lower. I think yeah. uh, currently he's being drafted as the wide receiver 44. So okay. um, it, it makes sense. I mean, like, I don't know. I don't know what to make of – like, you just have to assume Carolina's going to be a much better offense, right? They had a lot of O-line depth. They had these weapons – Listen, I know Thielen, like, flamed out. But even, like, towards the end of the year, he was still putting up, like, 40, 50 receiving yards a game. It wasn't the 100 he was doing the first half of the season. I still think Thielen's going to be a relatively decent player for the offense. And they've now gone back-to-back years investing very high draft capital in receivers. And Jonathan Mingo, first-round pick, Xavier Leggett. Like, I don't – I I agree that Deontay Johnson's going to lead that team in targets. I just don't know how how valuable that is. If he ends up with, like, 115 – Leads the team, scores like four to five touchdowns. I just don't think that's a great fantasy player we're going to get. The the thing with him is like, I think for the standpoint of NFL side, like a guy like Bryce Young, that, that dude is a separator. He is a very, yeah. very great elite mm-hmm. route runner. So the safety valve of like, I know Deontay Johnson's running like a curl or a hook, whatever, these short routes, and I can just throw the ball to him. I think that's going to be good for Bryce Young's development. But like... I don't know that the upside is there if he doesn't get to that 140 range of targets. And realistically, not that many players get there. With Leggett, Basically, if Leggett is solid, if Thielen doesn't go away, like if the whole if the whole wide receiver room isn't just corpse, he probably doesn't get to 140 targets. Right. That, that's like, what why if I Leggett think I is awesome. sell. What if Leggett's really good? Yeah. Was well, I, he, he could be. Right. Was I talking to you guys the other night when I said the Panthers had a have a YouTube series right now where they're kind of like 
showing it's kind of like a hard knocks version that they're doing from their own media I don't team. think I saw that no um I, I think I put it in our group chat but they were talking about on there and it was Dave Canales they were interviewing Dave Canales and talking about like what this offense is going to look like kind of what their plans are and it sounds like a lot of what he's trying to do is is really make it to where Bryce Young is making quick decisions it's it's first or second read and it's really just trying to keep it really short and, and keep it sweet yeah. which PPR monster but what's the upside would, that's what I'm saying is he like is he like a good version of like what Elijah Moore was last uh, year you're giving I mean he gets open but what if, if his a dot's like five yeah that's what seems I'm saying. like, like, that's like his yards per target number might be low as fuck I, I just think for what it's worth I know I nominated the player I think wide receiver 44 that number would, feels low. I would say he outperforms that. By the end of the year, I don't think he is lower than 44. Yeah, definitely not. I guess, though, where I, my hang-up, though, is, like, seventh round. Right, and that's what that's – The way, I, like Kamara the, the way and, I'm building yeah, my yeah, team, yeah. I'm just not drafting Deontay in round seven. There's just no way. Is that because you're going wide receiver early and then you're in those middle rounds is where you attack that running back? P- probably. But, like, even let's say I, I dabbled early in running backs, like, I'll just wait. I think that I think there's probably some round eight, round nine, or just round six receivers that I, I'd much rather take in those ranges. Yeah, um, that, personally, that to me feels like a really good value pocket for for RBs and in, in underdog. Like the more you do them, the more you realize like where the there's certain positions you should like, be attacking. I'm pretty sure you named Kamara and Montgomery, right? I did. Like so, those two, those two are guys that I'm taking 100. percent I don't care the format uh, ahead of. That dude. For me, Deontay Johnson feels a little bit towards the end of like where I really want to be investing in wide receiver because yeah. you get after after that group that I mentioned where it was like Rashi, Christian Watson, JSN. After that, you're talking like Curtis Samuel, Tyler Lockett, Romeo Dobbs, Rashid Shahid, Khalil Shakur. Like it, it really falls off. It feels yeah. like he's the last of like I'm comfortable plugging him in my lineup. I like that point you made. He might be the start of the next tier that I just don't want to be the first person drafting the start of a tier. I like that point. I think he was. You were saying he was the back. I'm saying of he's the, the end of that yeah. tier. And so I don't depending on how you look in. at Deontay, it could yeah. be great or terrible. But as you guys, I know, I feel like yeah. To your point, I guess so. from our dynasty videos and stuff like that, I'm a little bit more bought in on Bryce Young. I'm a little bit more yeah. bought in on Dave Canales, and so I think because of that, I'm a little bit more bought in on Deontay Johnson. So I, I think that's why I'm confident he outperforms 44. What's Deontay Johnson's upside this year to you? Th- th- that, that's the question I need to go back to. I, I like think, literally can't talk myself into like a 1200. Eight touchdown season. I can't. If like, it goes oh, well, okay. So I don't even like, feel like that's in the range of outcomes. If it goes Fair well, enough. where does his finish as a that, and then what does his finish wide receiver what? Like if it goes well, let's say if if everything goes well, mm-hmm. I see him as a top thirty six receiver. That yeah. That what's the what's the upside there though? Give me like a stat line for upside. I think he could go for a thousand and five. Okay, I, and, I, and I agree. I agree. Put him wide receiver probably 32. wide receiver thirty two. But and, and you that feel point, that's the most likely outcome? Do you feel like that's upside? I think that's that's probably a pretty neutral. Like, I, okay. I don't think that's a reach, but I also don't think that that's like, you, you know what I'm saying? I think it's, it's I, more middle line. So you're, line. You, you're projecting more of that. Okay. What, what if you like upticked it to where it's not egregious, but you think he's having a really nice season? 1,206 or 1,207. Uh, Which yeah. puts him at what now? Probably. Like, I mean, you can make the argument. Why does he 28? Five, maybe? Like, Thielen went over 1,000 last year. Yeah. I th- And I think Deontay's more talented than Thielen. Yeah. Godwin, yeah. Godwin went for 1,000 last year. Like, just to give you all the context. Remember, yeah. how, remember how meaningless that felt? Yeah. I, that's, I guess what I'm, that, that's what I'm saying. I like, guess that's where Deontay like, could have a good year, and it, I, I feel like he's going to end up being one of those players that it feels meaningless at the but end But there, the was, there was a lot of time last year where we were – very comfortable throwing Thielen in our lineups and just taking what we got out of that Because his offense. weekly ceiling was crazy for a long time. Right, and that was because of the volume that he yeah. was getting. And I think that's the same kind of argument with Deontay Johnson because the reality is he had all of those weeks with Bryce Young and this offense looking horrible. If we yeah. think that they take a step forward, it seems like it's more feasible that that actually happens for Deontay. There, yeah. There's two ways I look about this in redraft. First, in underdog format. So if you're doing that, best ball. Like... In this range, if I'm going to start drafting the, the receivers in this range, I'm almost at this point, I know he's not my receiver one. He better not be. Better not be. And I'd rather actually shoot on a much lower floor guy that actually has, like, if it hits, we pop. Well, like, that's we why have, I we said. Have, and we have crazy high weeks yeah. in, uh, to, to catch. That's why I said that tier, there's a lot of upside. You're talking about Rashi Rice, Christian Watson, JSN. Like, these guys, that if they hit, they could be really good receivers. Right. Um, and and that, so yep. – I, I agree with you. In best ball formats, you probably lean the other guys. But in a lineup league, a redraft league, where you have to set that, that lineup every week, that's yeah. there's more value for a guy like Deontay, I think. Well, that's, yeah. where, that's where I was actually going to say, though, like, okay, 
let's really you shallow out the roster format. So you're like you you've got six bench spots maybe. I'm not going to say it's Deontay, but you can get Deontay light off the wire a lot of times. Realistically, a guy that's maybe not quite Deontay, but like the flex viability weekly, not much, not, not much different. Pick up guys like Pop Douglas. There's going to be so many guys on the wire because it's just such a shallow format. I will say like in, in underdog format specifically, I don't think people put enough uh, leverage into the fact that it's half PPR. Mm-hmm. Yep. So Deontay takes a dip right off, there. Off the rip. And it's very touchdown dependent, right? Like, so a guy who score who has an upside of ten touchdowns is me way more valuable Christian than Christian Watson, right? Way more valuable than a guy who can catch eighty balls but five touchdowns is, is in the range of outcomes for me. We're so I think being, a, we're playing a weekly game, right? So I think like being really conscious of that is something really important, kind of lost on just like general player hype and not and looking I, enough at league settings. And I, I play, uh, I'm in eighteen dynasty leagues, and I think fifteen of them, fourteen or fifteen of them, are best ball format. So like. I think a lot about roster construction and best ball principles of like, especially down the line, I want some upside players. Deontay's I'm not saying I wouldn't have him in best ball, but you want a mix of floor guys and more so upside plays in best ball spike week guys. Yeah. Deontay just, he just, he just ain't the spike. He just don't do it for me. Talking about yeah. exposures. I want to say my Deontay exposure is pretty high. Oh, yeah, no. It has to be 22%. <laughs> All right. <laughs> that's I, every I'm four sure. drafts. It's you're every player. Deontay. He's got 22%. Yeah. It's actually yeah. crazy. That's what, he's probably got like every position literally just has four players and they're all 22%. <laughs> You've only drafted a total of 16 players on every Fair. fucking all 22. Oh, yeah. Damn. That's crazy. All right. Uh, I think we're going to wrap it up there because we're going to have to end up getting to our stream. So a couple things to leave you guys with. Again, this was our first redraft video together. We'll be doing this twice a week. We're about to go live on YouTube drafting an actual underdog draft against each other. If you want to be in the actual live stream itself and be asking us questions and kind of just like converse with us throughout, you have to be a big dog member. You can go sign up at bdge.co. We draft, uh, we drop the links to the drafts in, uh, in Discord. There's a private channel once you are a member. And uh, if you are new to Underdog, you can deposit and get up to $250 in bonus match using the promo code BDGE. So we'll be talking a lot about Underdog. We'll be doing a lot of drafts and streams throughout the summer. So if you're not on there now, now is the time to make the leap. All right? Promo code BDGE when you sign up. We're out of here. I love you. Smoochies. Yapping. Peace out.